liberty lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I am here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? Doing all right. How are you today? Pretty good. Glad to be back. Yeah, yeah. Glad to have you back. It's hard to do this by myself. Yeah. To talk for 40 minutes to nobody. <laughs> yeah. It's tough, man. I, I mean, know y'all are out there, so don't don't take that the wrong way, audience. I, I, I know you're there, but I'm... I, I am physically sitting in a room staring at a wall and a microphone <laughs> yeah, talking to myself. Yeah, it's tough. Um, it's tough doing one of those on your own. You just, it, it needs to be a conversation, you know? Mm-hmm. And uh, so I was actually, uh, I was texting with, uh, with GI Greg earlier about the last podcast. Yeah. Um, trying to get some input. Like my concern is that it was boring. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and but one of the things that I, I said to him is I, I think I that I need to be more organized when I'm doing it myself. Yeah. Like to treat it like a speech yeah. instead of me just having like a bunch of notes on a page that I you know things that I want to remind myself to get through, which actually isn't a whole lot different than how I do a speech. Yeah. But I you know I didn't prepare in the sense of like looking over my notes and thinking, okay, this is how I'm going to construct it and so forth. It was just... Yeah, having the order laid out and that mm-hmm. kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Like, I would be better off with an outline instead of a bunch of notes on a page. Yeah. Yeah, when I... On the rare occasion, I do things like that. I usually, like, do a list of bullet points mm-hmm. and then just kind of run down the bullet points. But public speaking really ain't my thing. Like, I, I can do yeah. it, but it's not... I mean, yeah. That ain't what I want to be doing. <laughs> it's funny how those things change in your life too, because there was a time when I had no problems with public speaking at all. Yeah. And, uh, and I realized when I ran for board of education in 2018 yeah. that that had changed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's not as easy as it used to be. <laughs> and, and it was weird. Like it was, I was kind of surprised at, um, the couple times that I, you know, was up in front of a group speaking like, how terrified I felt. Yeah. It goes away once you do it enough, mm-hmm. but it, and it's, it appears to be a perishable skill because yeah. in at times in my life where I've had to do a lot of that, it's not yeah, a problem, it's really easy. but when you go a while without doing it, the, the fear comes back. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was strange. Um, and you know, the good news is that like after those speeches that I gave, People were like, and I said something to, you know, to people that I, that I knew, you know, yeah. friends and family about like, hey, like, you know, I thought I might pass out before I got up on stage. I was like, oh, just don't pass out, you know? Yeah. Um, and they're like, what? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Didn't come through. Like, oh, thank goodness. Yeah. I, you know, thought everybody could see that I was like a deer in headlights up there, but yeah. I guess not. Yeah. And, you know, spoke fine. Yeah. And I, I like I remember um doing a uh, presentation in college. I don't remember what it was about. But um I remember doing a presentation in college and I made the mistake of uh of allowing myself to be interrupted for a question. Oh yeah. And so and what I should have done is when the question was asked I should have said, "Well, I'll, I'll get to that." Yeah. But what ended up happening was I answered their question. And then you lost track of where you were. And then I, I couldn't backtrack because okay. it would have been like awkward and strange. Yeah. And I'm, I'm not sure how, like I, I couldn't figure <coughs> out a way to like pull myself back to where I had been in my presentation. Yeah. So I just like took it from there. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and the professor afterwards was like, well, it was good, but I feel like there was something missing. It was kind of short. And I'm like, yeah, well, <laughs> this is <laughs> Turns what happened. Out, yeah. And, and I said, so, you know, it's like when he, and luckily he'd played some music when he had been younger. So he like got, understood this when I said it this way. I said, you know, it's like when you're on stage and you're playing a song and you forget a verse uh-huh. or, you know, like, I don't know, you forget the hook or something like that. You just, you just keep going because yeah. chances are nobody in that audience knows. Yeah. Yeah. Especially at the level that I was playing music, you know, it's yeah. not like this I, is his own rendition. Yeah, I, it's not like I had sold a million albums or yeah, something. Right. Everybody knew all the words to my songs yeah. or anything. I mean, like they weren't even my songs. I was playing with other people, but yeah. um, 
you know, it just it, when you screw up, you just keep going because if, if you stop, then everybody knows that you made a mistake. Yeah. But if you keep going, chances are nobody knows that you yeah. made a mistake. Well, and not only that, you can't go back to where you were at. Yeah. You can't go back to the, the, the verse you missed. <laughs> yeah. I did. I did play music with a girl one time that would do that. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, she, <laughs> she would start singing the, you know, the next verse but it wasn't the next verse. Yeah. And then she would announce to the audience like, Oh, that's not the right, <laughs> <laughs> the right verse. And she would back. And then, and then she would like try to get back into it. And I'm like sitting there just trying to go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, All right. Uh, look, funny. I'm just going to quit until you start playing again. <laughs> <laughs> you, you let me know when you're ready to go. And, uh, and then she would like find her way to it and finish the song and we'd finish the song. But, uh-huh. And I kept trying to tell her, like, just don't, just keep going. Yeah, These are yeah. all originals for you. Yeah. We've got 50 people in a room. All yeah. right. They won't they, know. Yeah. They're not going <laughs> to yell at you. You forgot the verse. <laughs> Although, actually, I do remember one show where she forgot the next verse and somebody in the front row reminded her. Yeah. And told her what it was. It's like, wow. Okay. We got a fan. <laughs> oh, man. Anyway. And, and that's kind of how I felt on the last podcast. Like, did I skip something? I'm pretty sure I did. Yeah. Maybe I didn't. Wait. Oh, yeah. There's that thing. And now I would go back. Yeah. Because nobody knows. Exactly. There you go. I had to hit all my points. Yeah. The, the, another mistake I think that I made in that was that, because I, I I'm kind of a completionist. Yeah. And so I'd been reading about stuff and I... I should have done that podcast at the end of the previous, uh, at the end of last week instead of the beginning of this week. Oh yeah. But I was reading this book about the Dulles brothers and, um, and they were getting into like the book was getting into the, the part where they controlled our foreign policy and was getting into the, their overthrows of, um, the Iranian government. And then, um, uh, was it Nicaragua? Yeah, I think it was Nicaraguan government. Yeah. And, um, and then, and so that's where I was and I was like, well, but Vietnam is a part of this. So there's gotta be a chapter on Vietnam. And then I realized that it was the next chapter. So I had to at least finish that before, before I did the podcast. And then yeah. that prompted some other things. So then I was looking some more stuff up on anyway. It, yeah. I, I think there was kind of an information overload. Yeah. Well, I mean, Vietnam's definitely something that, like, I mean, you talked about a bunch of stuff that I didn't know about. Um, you know, it's it, it, it's interesting to me. And it's so crazy, like, when you talk to people because they're like, well, you know, the government lies. But they, it's almost, in a, in a sense, like, well, the government's lied to us before, but they won't do it again. Yeah. And, this and time, they, they this can't time, be lying. This yeah. This, like, mm-hmm. it's a weird thing. Like, in the moment, you don't realize people generally just don't pick up on it the same way as they do in retrospect. It's like, mm-hmm. oh, yeah, well, we know the government did all these horrible things back in the whenever, the 60s, the 70s, blah, blah, blah. But it's different now. Yeah. But it's no different now. <laughs> like, yeah. it's not different. Like, I think it's uh, I think it's Jim Bovard. I think the name of the book is like Lost Rights or something like that. I read a few years ago. And he talks about exactly that, that for whatever reason, government lies can be exposed over and over and over again. And but you, but the next thing they say, people just assume is truth. Yeah, it's it's the oddest thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's and I was thinking about this earlier today, kind of just in retrospect after listening to to you do the podcast and it's 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 one of those weird things where like it's easy for us to always be well the government's lying the government's lying don't trust them but the government's not always lying about everything but you should treat it like they are Mm -hmm. like that's kind of the conclusion i came to earlier today i was like you know i mean sure because there are things i'm sure they get things right and there's things that they're not lying about but You should always treat it like they are, and then they should, the burden of proof should be on them to not be lying. You should always be treating it like they are. Yeah, mom was uh, talking to, I think it was talking to one of her caregivers about my podcast uh, with me standing there. Yeah. Um, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, and she was saying, you know, well, he he and I we often disagree about things, but um, but I have to listen because he turns out to be right a lot. Yeah. <laughs> And I said, well, if, if you assume that what you're being told is not the truth, you're going to end up being right more often than you're wrong. Exactly. 
And even and even if it does turn out to be true, you can still have that air of caution going in. Yeah. You know, you should always have that going into anything the government's telling you at any time. Trust but verify. Yeah, exactly. Said, right? <laughs> uh, well, oh, yeah. I, I think the point that I was trying to get to with that is that um, that in Vietnam, the government lied from the very beginning of it to the very end of it. Yeah. About a huge number of important points. Yeah. Um, I don't even think I really got into like the bombing of Cambodia and Laos and yeah. that where, where the president even lied to Congress about it Yeah, and they called it the secret war. <laughs> it, like there's not supposed to be secret wars. This is, right. a, this is supposed to be a, a constitutional Republic. Like this, <laughs> whatever. Anyway. Um, and I think the, the point that I was trying to get to is that, you know, the government is willing to, and often does lie to you over and over again yeah. to keep you in line with what their agenda is. And, and especially when it comes to war. Oh, absolutely. Because that's, I mean, that's the most important thing. So they mm-hmm. almost are obligated to not tell you what's going yeah. on there. Uh, but I was just going to say, it's not just... And it's weird looking at it because it's not just our government. It's not like our yeah. government just lies to us, but every other government in the world is just mm-hmm. amazing. Like they're all this way. Yeah. Like all governments lie. Like it's just, it's a cost of entry. Or yeah. Something. That's an IP stone thing, right? Isn't it? Like all oh, governments yeah. lie. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that was a, a thing from that old uh, a journalist. Yeah. I mean, um, it's true. Like that's just kind of the way it works, you know? That's, yeah. Well, I I um I hope that some people saw some parallels um with things that were going on. I I tried to draw some very specifically with the terror war. Um but I hope people see it in the uh Russia Ukraine thing as well. And uh you know, then another thing that mom said was well I I'm on Russia's side. Yeah. About me. Like, yeah. <laughs> Michael's on Russia's side. I was like no I'm not. I'm not on any government side. Yeah, that's exactly the answer. I don't yeah. support any of these governments. This is yeah. there isn't a. In fact, um, like there's a danger in this. Like we've heard this before. I got a clip. Okay. You want to hear a clip? Let's hear a clip. All right. Hang on. All right. Uh, waging uh, fierce brutality against uh, its neighbor without any justification whatsoever, without any basis uh, in uh, international law. Uh, no responsible country can be neutral uh, in a conflict like this. Certainly not any country that purports to uh, adhere uh, and to believe in the principles of the UN Charter, uh, because what Moscow is doing is uh, a blatant violation of the UN Charter, a blatant violation of international law. All right, so that was good old Ned Price from the State Department. He's the State Department spokesliar, yeah. has been for a while. And... Um, yeah, the the whole there's no room for neutrality here. Yeah. Uh I just think that that's a dangerous sentiment and and it echoes George Bush's you're either with us or you're with the terrorists. Thing. Yeah. And um I, I mean they did do the vote last week in the UN General Assembly um the referendum or resolution I guess, the resolution to telling Russia that they had to remove all their troops from Ukraine. Yeah which Russia's going to ignore. Obviously. Um, And there were like 141 votes for and 32 abstentions and seven voted against. Yeah. Um, But I think think everybody's ready for the war to end because it's had such a negative impact on so many economies. Yeah. But I I think that if it was, if it was asked differently, you may have had different results. Also, if the U.S. didn't have the strongest military in the world and control the uh, the world economic system, you might have had different results as well. Yeah, because there's obvious repercussions if you're not with us. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, and and they've made that clear that they oh, yeah. will sanction the hell out of anybody that's not part- participating. Exactly. On our side. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they haven't actually done that yet, but they've certainly put the threat out there oh, yeah. over and over again. And I was actually, I was listening to that particular briefing um, because 
I'd read an article that said that, uh, that Ned Price had said something along the lines of that, um, Russia and China have a shared vision. Cause this was about, uh, Wang Yi, the, um, Russian, I guess he's foreign minister or something, um, that had been at the Munich security conference, then went to Russia and met with Vladimir Putin on his way back to China. Yeah. All right. And so it was that day that that meeting had happened. Yeah. And uh, I'd read an article where Ned Price had said, well, that Russia and China share a vision and they're um, trying to create a world where a, where big countries can bully smaller countries into, um, into doing what they want to be done. And I, and I, I wanted to, I couldn't <laughs> find the, that bit. it's like an hour of him droning on. So it was yeah. like, it's hard um, to, it's hard to listen to. Yeah. I tried to skip through and just find it, but I couldn't find it. I found that clip instead, but I, I was thinking like, are you listening to yourself? Yeah, no self-reflection here whatsoever. Yeah. Like, <laughs> um, and what I find really interesting is that China just put out a document, uh, decrying U S hegemony and how they use their hegemony to, um, to, you know, try and control everything Yeah, that everybody's doing everywhere that yeah. they meddle and interfere in every nation's internal affairs, that they don't respect sovereignty, that, that, you know, and like I was reading through the points and I was like, well, I mean, not a lot to disagree with. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like they make a lot of points. Yeah. We are the empire. Yeah. Um, that they, uh, you know, that they keep, you know, talking about this rules based international order, but the rules are whatever we say the rules are. Yeah. And I mean, there's some, there's some truth to that. Like that we pick and choose where to apply the rules. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, um, well, and this deal with Ukraine is no different. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the same thing that, that Russia's doing now, we could be accused of and doing in Iraq, Afghanistan, like, all over the place. Like we, it's not like we don't do this. Syria, Yemen, Somalia, yeah. Mali, um, Libya. You yeah. could, in, in fact, you could accuse all of NATO about Libya yeah. and Syria actually. Yeah. Uh, so, but, but that's our side, you see. Yeah. And like, that's, we're all doing it for, you know, to maintain peace and security and, you know, democracy in the world. <laughs> that's, that's the claim. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I don't see that, I, I don't see that there's a lot of that. I, you know, one of the things that China, that China also said about the U.S. is that the U.S. has been um, the biggest uh, threat to peace and stability in the world for decades. Well, you just look at any of those countries you just named off. Like Libya is the one that jumps out to me the most. Mm -hmm. But are any of those countries better now than they were when we went in? Not saying they were great when we went in. Yeah. Just saying, are they better? Because I don't think you can find an example where they are. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's over a million deaths, uh, you know, close to 40 million refugees um, yeah. as a result of the American wars abroad. Yeah. And so, yeah, there's a, a point to be made. And, and going back to that last podcast, uh, you know, the, the U.S. launched their secret war into Cambodia, um, bombing along the frontier where there were... Uh, um, you know, South Vietnamese nationalists hiding. I mean, like yeah. they, they were, you know, doing their guerrilla tactics inside of South Vietnam and then crossing over the border to, to sanctuary, essentially. Um, the leader of Cambodia, uh, Sihanouk, said that he didn't want to get involved. And the truth is that he didn't really control the border area anyway. Like, I mean, it's like in Afghanistan. You talk about the Afghan national government not keeping the terrorists out. Like, yeah. the Afghan national government actually has any control over these areas. Yeah. Um, it was the same kind of thing with Sihanouk in Cambodia. Like, the, like, those lines on the map don't necessarily mean that he actually rules in that area. Yeah. Um, he, ain't, he ain't safe to go walk around there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, of course, the U.S. war created an outcry among the Cambodian people because we killed, you know, like half a million Cambodians. Yeah. And, um, and it destabilized that government yeah. that, you know, neutral government. And yeah. that was another problem too, is because, well, you can't be neutral in the war between communism and capitalism. Does this sound familiar? <laughs> right. And, you know, there's no neutral parties. It's not responsible to be neutral. You yeah. got to pick a side. Yeah. 
And, uh, you know, if you're, if you're neutral, then you're on the wrong side. Yeah, that, that's right. how the U S approached it certainly. Yeah. And so they destabilized the government. They, they created an uproar among the people about why he couldn't protect them. Um, that government fell and it was replaced by the Khmer Rouge. Yeah. And the Khmer Rouge was a brutal dictatorship that killed tens of thousands, <laughs> hundreds of thousands of their own people. Yeah. I mean, but that government that like the Khmer Rouge took over the government in Cambodia partly as a result of what, and I would say actually directly as a result of American interference in Cambodia that destabilized the existing government. Yeah. So. Made them easy to replace. <laughs> exactly. And, uh, and, and uh, frankly, we've done that. We did that again in, in Ukraine. Yeah. Um, in 2014, when we overthrew the, the elected government in 2014, that was, I mean, that wasn't actually the beginning of all this conflict, but yeah. I mean, it started before then even, but there has been a conflict, a, a civil war going on in Ukraine since then. Yeah. Because the elected government was overthrown through U.S. machinations and support yeah. and replaced with a government that large portions of the population in the east and south of the country didn't want. Yeah. And, you know, uh, as far as being a supporter of Russia, I'm not a supporter of Russia, There, but Russia's story isn't getting out there. Like, there's a, a real strong narrative in Western countries about the way this is supposed to be viewed. And the Russian perspective is being ignored and Russia has legitimate security concerns. Yeah. And, and they're, you know, going back to the, um, the international order, the rules, the, that everybody's supposed to abide by. I mean, one of those things, at least the way the Russians are interpreting it, and I think it's a fair interpretation is that you're not supposed to, um, obtain your security at the expense of someone else's. Yeah. Like that all nations have a legitimate concern about their security and that if you are, if you are ensuring your own security at the expense of somebody else's, that that's against the international order as well. Yeah. Which and we're f- doing to Russia and spades. Yeah. And they, they feel that that's what's happened here. Yeah. Um, and, uh, Oh man, there was another point that I was going to make about that. Oh, uh, so no, I'm not on Putin's side and I'm not on Zelensky's side and I'm not on Biden's side either especially not on biden's side well i would i would say especially not on biden's side he he, he I mean, frightens me yeah um we, we a, can lo- get a lot that a, a lot of minute. this comes down to and not saying that anybody else would have been any better particularly mm-hmm. but like this is on biden's plate like this happened yeah. on his watch well it's true but biden uh, so trump's been going around saying that well, this never would have happened if he'd been reelected like this yeah. never would have happened and, and i don't necessarily buy that well i don't either he's the one that i mean like he created this problem in a sense by uh, he was the one that started selling arms to ukraine yeah that or was, not selling like that shit, was, well, that yeah, was the I mean, whole phone call but, yeah. yeah, yeah, he was impeached for holding up arms sales to yeah, Ukraine. Exactly, which he ended up um, giving them. By yeah. the way, <laughs> and anyway. he didn't. Yeah, he didn't even actually hold them up. He. Yeah. It's not like he, he threatened could, to hold them up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that was a that was a line that even Obama, who started all those extra wars, wouldn't cross. Yeah. I mean, it was the Obama government that that um, d- you know, that designed that planned the overthrow of uh, the Ukrainian government in 2014 to to place a pro western government in. Yeah. Um but even the even the president who launched the coup wouldn't give him <laughs> weapons, <All> right? <laughs> um but here we are. And so but the the point that I would make is that I'm on the side of the Ukrainian people. Yeah. And the best thing for the Ukrainian people is for the war to end. Peace is the best thing for the Ukrainian people. Not to help Ukraine continue to fight Russia. That's not going to do them any good. The longer this war goes on, the more of them die. The yeah. more livelihoods are lost, um, the more destruction in that country. Like, if you want to help the Ukrainian people, then the push is for peace. Yeah. Not to support the Ukrainian government, not to support the Russian government, not yeah. to play the blame game or whose side. It's just to end the war. Yeah. And if ending the war means... Um, ceding territory that doesn't want to be under the government of Kiev anyway to Russia, like, so be it. That's a fair deal. Like that's yeah. yeah I mean that's that's fine. Um, I, I don't know. I, 
and, and as far as Biden, Biden and Putin are concerned, um, you talk about a history of destabilize. So this is, this is what we learn looking over American foreign policy history is that, um, the, the U S intelligence or military or government or whatever, whoever's making these decisions in the end, isn't very good at, at, I guess, at anticipating long-term consequences. Yeah. And the results of destabilization, <laughs> yeah. we, we got a new member of the table here. <laughs> yeah, um, we do. <laughs> they're not good at anticipating long-term consequences. Mm. And that it seems to me that most of the time that they destabilize a government or overthrow a government, the one that replaces it is worse than the one that was there before. Yeah. And I, I keep thinking about this, especially in terms of, of Vladimir Putin, who there's been calls for regime change in Russia by U.S. government and intelligence for a long time now. Yeah. But I'm personally, first off, I actually do have a real respect for him. Yeah. Because what I've seen in his dealings in the past several decades is that he is, I mean, some of these things are like, exactly what you, what you fear about leaders in general. I mean, part of this arises from, uh, you know, him being a sociopath, but they're all sociopaths. I mean, I, I think that to rise to that level of power, you kind of have to be a sociopath. I think it's true of American politicians too. Oh yeah. Um, but anyway, like one of the, one of the personality or, you know, like some of the personality traits that I appreciate is that, is that he is cold and calculating and cautious and I think restrained. Um, I, like yeah. I think of when the Americans killed the, um, the Russian, um, the Russian soldiers in Syria. Yeah. And he was like, well, you know, mistakes happen. We understand. Blah, blah. Like, yeah. Did not make it a, because if that had happened the other way around. Yeah. Cause that could have been the beginning of world war three then. Yeah. And, I think that he's been very reasonable and he's been very clear about his concerns for a long time in yeah. Ukraine. Um, and I, like I, you know, I certainly as a libertarian and somebody who believes in self-government, I definitely understand the argument about that nations should be able to choose their own alliances and, and their own relations and so forth. Yeah. But there in, in order for it to be, peaceful you do have to consider other nations concerns as well when you're making these decisions yeah like personally i mean okay so maybe it's it's kind of like this it's like you know people should be free uh to to choose their own relationships so if you and your friend's girlfriend both really like each other then you should be free to engage in that relationship if you both choose to voluntarily. Yeah. However, if you think you can do that yeah. without creating a real conflict with your friend, yeah. then you're wrong. <laughs> you haven't tried to do that before if that's what you think. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so, I mean, you before you make this decision, yeah. you should consider what some of these consequences could be. Oh, absolutely. And our State Department does not do that. Right. Like, at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the, you, you know, your friend whose girlfriend that you're trying to get together with yeah. is a party that whose opinion matters. Yeah, right. <laughs> Even yeah. though he's trying to limit your choices. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. But maybe so. some other decisions should be made before this. Yeah. Like, <laughs> right. I, I mean, so I hope that that's an example that people can understand, but because that's kind of what that's happened. where, yeah. And, um, oh gosh, what was his name that was on, uh, the daily show that said essentially that about Ukraine, that we were trying to s- steal Russia's girlfriend away. Yeah. That was John Stewart. Right? Um, I don't, well, no, the person that was speaking was, wasn't. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, I, I don't remember who it was now. I remember uh, I that even, clip, though. Yeah, okay. I think John Stewart was still was hosting the host. it then. Yeah, yeah. I was trying to think if it was him or Craig Kilborn at the time. Oh, I, I don't know. I couldn't remember. I'm but pretty it, sure I, it was I think Stewart. you're right. I think yeah. it was John Stewart. And I don't remember who the... the. It was an intelligence or a State Department guy. 
Yeah. Um, that just like just said exactly that. Just that laying we're it out. To yeah. Keep Russia distracted while we steal a, steal their girlfriend out from under them. Talking, yeah. referring to Ukraine. Yeah. Oh yeah. And um, the distraction was the Olympics, if I remember correctly. I think you're right. Yeah. Yeah, they were they were trying to oh look at all the medals you Russia won at the Olympics. Mm-hmm. Whole time we're like swooping in to get re- Ukraine. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so yeah, we've we've created another problem by and so I, I guess I, that was the point that I was trying to get to actually um, is that uh, if if we think that we're going to destabilize Russia and get Putin out of power. The thing that you have to consider is who's going to take his place. Yeah, and the thing you have to the thing you really have to consider is okay. So so we've done this before. Like I mean, just look at the track record of okay, we've we've toppled these dictators and moved these people out and so on and so forth. Yeah, but, Iran is a cautionary tale. Yeah, yeah. Ex- well, exactly because the the point I was going to make is none of these are like nuclear superpowers and you can say whether or not Russia is a superpower or not, they're absolutely a nuclear armed country. Yeah. And they ain't small. <laughs> no, no. So it covers like 11 time zones or something. I think it's seven. So what, I think it was the Soviet Union that was 11 time zones. I oh, think wow. Russia's only seven. Yeah. It's big. Yeah. They, they got a lot of folks there. Mm-hmm. Um, so you're talking about wanting to, <sighs> to do what we've done that hasn't worked in all of these other countries. I always get irritated mm-hmm. when people. Like in the media and stuff, start talking about well, Putin's got to go. Putin's got to go because exactly what you're saying is is it? Like you don't know what you're going to get when you replace him. Well, they and think the that they're going to put they, they think that they're going to put an American puppet into that place. But that ain't going to happen. Like, more likely to happen is that you're going to end up with a very anti-American reaction. Yeah. Um, Even if Russia. you put that puppet up there, that puppet may last. A year, but that ain't yeah. going to be a permanent. Uh, you're talking about a country that's uh, no different than the U.S. Like if if Russia came in and threw a puppet dictator in the U.S., how you mean long? like uh, like Donald Trump? Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh wow. I didn't make that connection. But how long would that last? Like it lasted I mean, four years. It lasted four years <laughs> exactly. And then look at what we got. We got Biden. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. Who's who's likely to? Oh, no, not likely. But yeah. Um, is likely well, enough that I'm concerned yeah. about him starting a wider war. Well, exactly. And, and that, you know, that was the point that I was going to make about Putin is that like there's a stoicism there that I appreciate. That used to be a virtue of of masculinity or whatever, and it, it isn't in this country anymore. And I don't know why. Yeah. Um, because I do think that it's a virtue. Like there's there is there's something to be said in this country about men just aren't really men anymore. Yeah, like well, there, was, there's not as many of them. I'll say like the the <laughs> amount of men in this country has decreased by yeah. a lot. I wasn't gonna go that direction with it, but I, I do think that there's a value. I'm not gonna argue with you either. Yeah, I, I do think that there's a value to the self control, like emotional control. Yeah. Um and. Biden doesn't have it and ne- never has. No. I, I think like if you go back to after he, I think it was after he was elected, but before he took office, um, talking about Biden and saying that he, he scares me as a leader in this country because his entire career has been reactionary and panicky. Yeah. And that's exactly not the person that I want in control here. I, I don't yeah. want the panicky reactionary, you know, short term, you know, short term thinking guy to have his finger on the nuclear button as it were. (laughs) And, uh, but that's what we've got. And he's, to me, he continues to act this way. Um, and it's only gotten worse, honestly, because now I think that he doesn't even have like the memory to, you know, to think of things in long term you know, and long-term goals. Yeah. Well, I mean, the man can't have too many long-term goals left. Like, I mean, (laughs) if if he blew this country up, like what does he care? He's only got a few years left anyway. Right. right? right. (laughs) Yeah. And, and his good son's already dead. Yeah. Right. Oh, that was cruel. Sorry. I I apologize for that one. That was unnecessary. Wow. That's still true. It's (laughs) the man's a shadow of his former self. It's funny. So we were, we were watching something the other day at the house. And you know my wife, she's not super political or whatever. Mm-hmm. But um, 
there was it was a clip from the 90s and it was biden talking about it was a tough on crime thing where he was talking Mm -hmm. because you remember he was the architect of the 90s crime bill and stuff and so Mm -hmm. he was talking about it and my wife like looks over at me she's like who is that i recognize that who is that? I, she couldn't place him. Yeah. She didn't realize it was Biden. I was like, that's Joe Biden. Mm-hmm. And she thought I was kidding at first. And she was like, wait, what? Or, and I was like, no, that's him. Like, that's that's who he used to be. Yeah. Like, it's insane. And it's insane that he's been there that long. He had been there a long time in the 90s. Yeah. He entered uh, He entered um, federal office in 1973. Was it 73? That was before I was born. Wow. I was well, and I'm the old man. I was going to say it well before I was born, yeah. so... No, that's, it's just, yeah, it, it makes no sense to leave these people in power that long. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, there was a, there was a minimum age for the presidency in the constitution. I guess they never thought that they, yeah. anybody would live this long. And yeah, so uh, I don't know, there might, maybe they should have made, I mean, like you have to retest for a driver's license after a certain age. Yeah. Like, and you know, for a fact that they would never let, nobody would ever let Biden behind the wheel of a car, like yeah. not on an open highway, <laughs> like not on the open road. Maybe like if you had like a closed. Like out on a desert road. Yeah. You know, yeah. Old farm road or something. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. No, but maybe. Yeah. There's, yeah, there's no way if you were one of Biden's kids, you'd let him drive. As, and maybe you can't stop him, though. I remember trying to stop my dad from driving. It was, hey, it's a tough thing, but you tried. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did. Like, like pl- just pull over. Pull yeah. over now. Let me let me take over here. Exactly. <laughs> here, no. just give but, me the keys now. Yeah, but that guy's I'll running. I'll drive. I'll drive. That guy, <laughs> and I'm using air quotes, is running the country. Yeah. With his finger on the button. Well, you told, I, like, I hadn't heard this news, but you told me when you got over here that, uh, a Blinken and um, and uh, Sergey Lavrov finally spoke. Ten minute meeting. Not a lot was said. Um, I mean, it had just happened shortly before mm-hmm. I had came over, but the, everybody was clamoring on the news about it. That um, apparently, the idea I got: Have they had any face to face meetings since this has happened? Nope. I didn't think so. Um, and apparently, this one was brief, and it was basically the U.S. wanting to say that, well, you know. We're not in charge over what the Ukrainians decide to do, but we don't approve of what you're doing. Was mm-hmm. the gist of what had came out about it? Yeah. So well, I so I heard um, there was a Scott Horton interview recently. I can't remember who he was interviewing, um, but they said that that they thought that Anthony Blinken might be the worst diplomat in the history of the United States. Um. And so I, I think, stopped to think about that. I was going to say, I was, like, there should be some evidence to support that. Like, the um, fact that he hasn't even met with Lavrov. Ha- has never made an attempt for a diplomatic solution for anything. Ever? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, the, like, he's more of a militarist than the DOD. But but when I, I was thinking about that, and I thought, well, but I am reading this book about the Dulles brothers, and I think that you could probably make a stronger case that Foster Dulles was the worst diplomat in the history of the U S but oh, yeah. Yeah. Did he get us into a nuclear war? Uh, not quite, but close. I mean, but you know, he laid down like, first off he was, um, the state department head when, uh, the U S overthrew its first government. Okay. In Iran. Yeah. Well, that didn't help us out in the long run. Well, no. It? Yeah. Um, and, uh, he was like, he came into office after they'd made the settlement in Korea, but he was livid about it. Oh Yeah. Um, but he couldn't do anything. It's too late. Yeah. Or he would have, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, like if he, if it had been his choice, like they wouldn't have had the ceasefire in Korea. Wow. Um, who knows how many more Americans would have died there. Yeah. Uh, but of course he, he's the one that, that started the Vietnam conflict too. Yeah. I mean, not the active war part where the U S was involved, but, yeah. but laid the groundwork, um, supported the, uh, supported DM in the South and uh, convinced him not to honor the um, the Geneva Agreement. Yeah, and not hold elections and you know all that stuff that that led to the war that we eventually got involved in. Yeah. Um. And uh, he apparently he was just kind of this aloof, like nobody really liked him. Yeah. I, I suppose anyway. So like even our allies, like Winston yeah. Churchill, had some not very nice things to say about. Oh yeah, Foster Dulles. Okay, um, 
And that was our, our great like, ally that we just won World War II with. Well, I was going to say, it seems like if you're going to be a diplomat, yeah. like, yeah, that people ought to you generally... Be charismatic. Yeah, people <laughs> yeah. should generally like you. You should be a person that when they walk, you walk in the room, people are like, oh, that guy. Yeah. Well, the funny part to me is that his brother, Alan, was that guy. He was like oh, yeah. this gregarious, charismatic guy that everybody liked. Yeah. And he ran the CIA. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's the director uh, of the CIA. He's the covert operative. Maybe we had those guys backwards in their positions. I don't know about that. Yeah. I think you probably need charisma in both of those jobs. That's probably true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Foster should have stuck with banking and lawyer lawyerly lawyerliness. Yeah. Although like he so but what he what he did his supposed triumphs are like um the the Paris peace agreement after World War II and yeah. um you know he I, I don't know he he was involved in some big uh treaties that benefited the US. Yeah. He was good at like putting the language together in such a way that America first. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Which wasn't a bad thing back then. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but like I said, he, on the podcast, he's the same guy that, um, backed Hitler until world war two began. Oh yeah. Um, because he, he saw the Nazis as, as great to be used against the communists in Russia. Oh yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. He was like, oh yeah, well we need these, these Nazis will be great yeah. fighting the Russians. <laughs> um, and I guess they were in a lot of ways, but, uh, but we were on the other side of that at the time. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Ah, uh, this is, uh, yeah, this is, but, but he is, um, I mean like he's the, the state department head that, that really kind of designed the beginning of the American empire idea. Yeah where we were involved in everybody's government all over the place to make sure that that every that everything worked out for the United States this big mm -hmm. you know internationalist idea uh corporatist idea of the US using its power to make sure that um you know American corporations succeeded all over the world yeah. now to be fair um like any good villain yeah he thought that he was doing a good thing for everybody. I mean, oh. you know, he, he seems to have legitimately believed that American corporate success around the world would be a benefit to everybody around the world. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and in he some respects, he wasn't trying to burn those countries down. Yeah. Well, I mean, in some <laughs> respects he's right. Like there is, yeah. you know, well, everybody needs a McDonald's Mike. Yeah. I mean, there was a, a rise in standard of living in places where American corporations got involved. Yeah, um, because they had the McDonald's. Uh, yeah, I don't know. When did McDonald's first? I have no uh, clue. I just it's the first when you say corporate, it's the first thing that pops in my head. No, it was mostly banking with him. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, you wasn't the McDonald's man. I don't think so. Uh -uh. I, I don't think so. I I wouldn't say that. I, I don't recall them saying he was a man of simple tastes. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> um, fastidious though. But anyway, I've gotten way off track and, and actually, you know, the other, the other clip I had, I think we'll just save that for a future podcast. Cause it's worth talking about some other time. Um, you wanted to talk about the train song. Yeah. I just wanted to kind of mention, you know, I'm sure everybody's heard about the train derailment in Ohio. And uh, we've been making fun of it on our Facebook page for <laughs> for, a, for a couple of weeks now. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah the, the I mean, not making fun of it. That was a that was poor choice yeah, words, yeah. I suppose. Meaning it, yes. <laughs> um, and it's it just goes to show, like, because the, the response, the government response has been horrible. Mm -hmm. um, that if if you're looking for the government to come save you, you probably should keep looking. Like, yeah, you should probably look somewhere else. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It looks well. Yeah, that's what I mean. Look somewhere else because mm -hmm. the, it's just it's not happening. Like. Um, yeah, I mean, what I was trying to think of, it, it seems to me really clear. So there's been a lot of outcry about, oh, you know, why hasn't why hasn't Biden visited? Well, what's that going to do? I mean, yeah. really, like, what's that going to do? Um, well, you know, they denied FEMA. Uh, of course, Buttigieg finally went out there. Um, 
Yeah, we've I, been memeing the crap out of that too. <laughs> yeah, I, I hadn't seen him since. Oh uh, yeah, maybe not on our page, but it's yeah. it's out there. Yeah. Um. But the the idea that you if something like this happens and you're like, well, you know, the government needs to come in and fix this or make things better for me or whatever, like it's not going to happen. And I don't think that it ever has. So here's a challenge for our audience. Yeah. Michael at the Liberty Mike.com. If you can name for me um, any disaster in the U.S., natural or man-made disaster in the U.S., where the government response has been good, I want to hear about it. Yeah. Because I can't think of one. Yeah, we were talking about this pre-podcast, and I, I, I'm with you. Like, I can't, I can't remember any. Like, I mean... Katrina? Nope. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And I was going to say a minute ago, like this kind of has hallmarks of Katrina where Bush like mm-hmm. flew over and had the plane fly low so he could see <laughs> yeah. like that. This, that's what this reminds me of. Mm-hmm. Um, but even if, but the thing was like, they give Bush a bunch of crap about that. But the truth is, would it have been any different if he had went? Like what no. would have changed? No. I mean, they mocked Trump. Um, where was it? He went where he was throwing the toilet paper um, or the, the, I don't even remember. It, there was some natural uh, was disaster. Was it the hurricane in Florida? Was it um, in Florida? Irma? Oh, it may have been. I can't remember now. It was a. I think it was a hurricane. It was a net because, yeah. It was probably Irma because that, we had Har- Harvey Irma. That was while Trump was in office, right? I think the so. Two back to back category fours. Yeah. One hit and Texas. They, one hit Florida. Yeah. Um, and I I didn't have a day off for almost three months. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. there you go. That must be it then. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they mock Trump over going like, so, I mean, mm. and this would have been no different if Biden went there and spent a week, like it, they would have mocked him then too. Yeah. Well, um, no, they wouldn't have. Well, I don't know. People would have. Yeah. People. I would mean, have. he would, Media he would. Wouldn't have. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the government it's it, the big thing that gets me with this one though, is that this, they intentionally set fire to this these chemicals that were let loose Mm -hmm. and then uh, goes back to what we talked about at the beginning of the podcast, where you just can't trust your government because from what I can tell, at least they're lying about the stuff that's in the air and in the water in these areas. Now they're telling everybody to go home that it's fine, but I'm telling you right now, if I lived there, I wouldn't be going home because it doesn't look fine. The stuff I've seen. What was the, um, I can't remember the the guy what the department was. I think it was like maybe agriculture or EPA. Actually, EPA. I think it was EPA. Yeah. Um, they were talking to the guy about it, and he kept, you know, he didn't he didn't handle this very well. He was like just oh, kept man. saying, "Yeah, uh, well, you know, we're we're testing, we're we're working on this, you know." Oh, I wish we um, had those. Clips. We're we're actively testing, and then they ask him another question, and he's like, "Well, we'll have crews out there real soon." Like, well, how are you actively testing if you don't have crews out there right now? You don't even have crews there. Yeah. yeah. And then um, he's like, "No, everything's safe. You're good." And the, the guy's like, "Well, will you drink the water there?" He's like. Well, you know, we've got crews on their way out there. Like, he's going back to the other thing. I mean, yeah. Oh, oh I wish we had those clips because yeah. that was, that was, I mean, it would be a riot if it was like, cause it looks like satire. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like but the, the, this but, is the kind of thing that you would write into a movie yeah. if you're making fun of. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, but it's absolutely horrible for the people that live there. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, and and that's what you get from your government. Like that's yeah. that's just what it is, man. None of these people are competent. If no. they were if they were competent, they would work in the private sector. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. There there are only a few areas where you can be a government employee and be competent, and that's when there is no private sector for what you're doing. Yeah. Like the EPA. Yeah. So Well, y- yeah, I guess no, but there's plenty of um. Uh, what, what do you call them? inspectors? I was gonna not inspectors isn't really what I was going for, but there's the there's plenty plenty of ecological um, groups. Yeah, yeah, but they don't so. pay like the government does. Well, that's that volunteer work. <laughs> I I don't know. Um, I mean, I don't know. Either. I, I, I don't I'm know. Talking. I think that that's changed with the green movement. Yeah. I, I could be wrong. I don't know. I mean, yeah, I don't know either. So, well, that guy's I'll, not competent anyway, even no, though he didn't have anywhere else to go. Yeah, that was, um, yeah, that was, like I say, see, really, but like the EPA, like that's not, you know, what they should be hiring at the EPA is like chemists and various kinds of scientists that, you know, that understand ecology and, 
and things like that. Yeah. Um, so like if you were competent at those things, yeah. you'd be working for like Dow chemicals or DuPont or something. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, <right>. like <laughs> someone in the private sector. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then of course, you know, the, the spokes liar, he just, uh, he's just a politician. Yeah. Yeah. And even though there's nowhere else to go to do that thing, you're like, none of them are competent. Yeah. I think we're proving over and over, <laughs> over and over again. So. Yeah. I, part, I wonder if part of it lies in just the idea of a career politician. Yeah. Um, that if, if politicians were what they were meant to be in this country, like somebody taking time off from their career to serve the public for a brief period, like we might see some real competence. You but, mean like Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer and I, I, I can't even, yeah, all of them. Yeah. <laughs> Adam Schiff. Adam Schiff, yeah. Biden for that yeah. matter. Yeah, they were supposed to be people like Trump. <laughs> yeah. you, you guys couldn't see the expression I made when I said that. So yeah, yeah. maybe that won't come across quite right over the podcast, but, yeah. um, but I mean, that's a lot closer. Like, I, I do think of, I, you know, I do think of people that aren't lawyers that are in this, yeah. in these jobs, um, that they a little bit more closely represent Thomas what Massey, I think politicians Rand were supposed Paul, to be. Yeah. Like people who were already successful in the, in the private sector yeah. and have came over to try to clean up the government. Good luck. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm sure they're feeling real good about that. Yeah, exactly. Hey, but I've been like looking into uh, Massey's area. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. yeah. I, I have. P- like, pretty nice part of the country. Yeah. 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 Northern Kentucky. I, like, I could do Northern Kentucky. All right. Um, you know, you're not far from Cincinnati. I, I'd be a lot closer to my brother's family. Like, yeah. Yeah. The people just, up there keep voting in Massey. So yeah, exactly. Something. That's why. <laughs> there's got to be a lot of cool and people Rand there. Paul. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because they're are they both in the same district? Well, Rand Paul's a senator, so he's the whole oh, state. Okay, so he's the whole state. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like Kentucky seems pretty cool. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of cool people in Kentucky. Somewhere around Springfield. Like, yeah. Bowling Green. Uh, yeah, maybe. I don't know. I had that's where the Corvette again. plant's at. That's the reason okay. it came out. <laughs> You can go visit the Corvette Museum anytime you wanted. Yeah. That that would be awesome. It would be awesome. Anytime I wanted. Anytime Maybe you I could wanted. A, a year pass. <laughs> yeah, all right. Yeah. I, I come know. I come up and visit you. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> I think that I would be going to distilleries instead of the Corvette place. Ah. Uh, Probably. I'm probably. not I'm just I'm not a car guy. Yeah. Oh. Uh, not tell you I don't know. Have you ever been to the Corvette Museum? It may change you. No, I've been to the Packard Museum though. I've been to the Packard Museum. It didn't change me. But it didn't I change me either. But I like. But it was I cool. enjoyed it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I would go to the Corvette Museum. I'm not saying that I would, you know, boycott it or anything. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm just saying that that I would probably go to the Corvette Museum. Yeah. Once and, and not be changed. <laughs> <laughs> Once, yeah, and not be changed. Yeah. Um, and I would go again when you came up and insisted that we yeah. go to the Corvette Museum, and that would probably be the last time I ever went. Oh, okay. Unless it changed you. Unless it changed me, but I don't think it will. No, well, you never know. I like my BMWs. BMWs are cool. God, stick with my German engineer. <laughs> my car has 300,000 miles on it. Yeah. And it runs pretty good. Yeah. And the I, one I had before had 330,000 miles on it before it died. Yeah. Well, something to be said. Yeah. I don't make cars like that in the U.S. No, well, they don't make them anywhere like that. I don't think and, anymore. Well, yeah, maybe anymore. I I had a uh, I had a Japanese car once that I got three hundred and twelve thousand yeah. miles out of. I think. Hey, I got right at three hundred before I got rid of my Honda, yeah. and it was still going when I got rid of it. Yeah. So. Yeah, but actually, mine was still running too. It's just. Yeah. I didn't want to drive it anymore. <laughs> I was yeah, tired I'd, of it. I, I'd had to replace too many pieces. I had put of like most of those miles on that car. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of I, done I don't with think, it. I'd put like 150,000 on mine. Yeah, I, put I, like, I think I got it with, with like 178 or something. Yeah, I had gotten that Honda with 110, I think, on it. Well, this is definitely devolved. So let's, <laughs> like, we can continue this discussion off mic. Yeah. Um, 
But yeah, don't trust your government, man. Yeah. Like, <laughs> that you, seems you, like a study theme here. And even though... You can't seems, depend on them to rescue you. That's yeah. definitely true. Well, and like I say, just always err with a side of caution. Like, you will be right more than you're wrong if mm-hmm. you err with caution with anything the government says. Yeah. Just approach everything with skepticism. Just approach everything with skepticism. Yeah. Um, like, go... This is one of the things... This is... This is where I tried to end the last... I don't think I succeeded. But this is where I tried to end the last podcast. Um, was saying that at, at that time, uh, through the Vietnam era, when the government and the mainstream media was lying to you, you didn't have a lot of other sources. Yeah. Like, there wasn't a lot of... It wasn't easy to find other information. Yeah. Um, dissenting views and, and stuff like that. Um, that's changed. Yeah. Like they can do their best to censor all this stuff. They can throw us off of YouTube or whatever. Yeah. Um, but everything lives forever on the internet. And uh, it, it's definitely easier to find dissenting views and alternative sources and real information if you're willing to look for it. And um, so just be willing to look for it and you can be smarter than everybody around you too. Absolutely. That's a good... Like us. Exactly. <laughs> That's a good note to end on. Yeah. I appreciate that, Michael. So, with that in mind, I will be out of town next week. Oh, so no podcast? Yeah, going to Tennessee. Oh, that's right. That's next week. I didn't realize that was... Yeah, next it week's snuck up here. on me, too. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, I will be drunk. woo Yeah. Hopefully. I may record a podcast, but it won't be this podcast. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, so I'm not sure what we do about next week. I don't know. Because, uh, yeah... I leave before you're available and come back after. Hmm. So when do you leave? Wednesday. Come okay. back Sunday. Yeah. So that's the problem. Oh. So we may we may not have a podcast next week. Okay. Or I may dig up some more history stuff and Yeah, do a solo or do an, do another one and, and have an outline. Yeah. D- and do it better. Always gotta be moving forward. Do man. it better. Um, this time you'll get it right. Yeah, maybe. (laughs) Uh, uh, so, but you can still follow us on Facebook. You can subscribe on iTunes, YouTube, Podbean, uh, like, and share, um, comment, um, review, uh, tell your friends, all that other stuff that helps our message get out there. Yep. Share our Um, memes. Yeah, that too. And uh, we'll be back when we're back and we finally get this right. All right. In the meantime, try to stay free. Life's short. Live free. Ciao. Later. Later.